if you think about it, Earth has been spinning for a long, long time. I mean, a really long time. And that's kind of an amazing thing to comprehend. So what is it that keeps the Earth rotating along its axis? The answer lies in the idea that momentum not only occurs in a linear fashion, but also in rotational motion. Hopefully at this point you are catching on to the idea that every rotational motion has something in linear motion that can be related to. The same is true for angular momentum. Linear momentum was defined as the mass of an object times its velocity. So to describe angular momentum, we use the angular analog to mass, which we defined as the moment of inertia, multiplied by the angular analog to velocity, which is angular velocity. This is true for a symmetrical object that is rotating about a fixed axis through the center of mass, where i is the moment of inertia and omega is the angular velocity. Now we want to look at these units just a little bit because they are different from those found when we determine linear momentum. Linear momentum units are kilograms times the mass divided by the time. Remember that i, the moment of inertia, found by taking the mass times the radius squared, which gives us the first part of the term as kilograms times meters squared. Angular velocity is labeled as revolutions per second, so our units for angular momentum turns out to be kilograms times meters squared divided by time. We can relate this to both linear momentum and the change in momentum. Since this is just some object moving in a circle, the moment of inertia is mass times the radius squared. Then recall that the velocity can be found by multiplying omega and radius. This is kind of cool because cancel out a couple r's there and it works out the angular momentum is equal to the mass times the tangential velocity times the radius. We also know that the linear momentum is defined as the mass times the velocity, so we can even substitute linear momentum into our expression. This just means that we can determine angular momentum from linear measurements if that's the information that we have. Now we can also relate the angular momentum of an object to the amount of torque that it exerts to get the object moving. Recall that net force is equal to the change in momentum over time. Since torque is essentially the force being applied to the object, we can substitute in our angular momentum just like we substitute in torque for net force. So applying a larger torque will result in the angular momentum being larger. If we go back to our original question of why the Earth is still rotating, we can use our expression for angular momentum to give us an actual value. Now the Earth is essentially a sphere rotating about its axis. So from figure 10-12 in our textbook, we can look up the moment of inertia for a rotating sphere. The mass and radius of the Earth are both things we can look up as well. All we have to do here is plug in those numbers to give us a moment of inertia of 9.72 times 10 to the 37th kilograms times meters squared. Now the angular velocity of the Earth is one revolution per day, which does not work really well with the units we have for momentum. One revolution is equal to two pi radians, and there are 6.64 times 10 to the fourth seconds in one day. This gives us the Earth rotating at 7.27 times 10 to the negative fifth revolutions every second. Then we can get around to multiplying our moment of inertia times our angular velocity to find 7.07 .07 times 10 to the 33rd kilograms times meters squared per second. This is a really big number, but keep in mind that the Earth is really, really big, and as we know, it just keeps spinning. Suppose a 2.5 newton perpendicular force is exerted on a 2.60 meteor radius lazy Susan for about 0 0.150 seconds. What is the final angular momentum if friction is negligible? We are actually looking for a change in angular momentum here, so there must be some net torque being applied. To solve for that change in momentum, we simply need to rearrange our equation. At first, that may not appear to help us much with the information we were given, but then we should soon realize that torque is equal to the perpendicular force applied at a certain radius. So we can plug in our expression for torque, and we end up with an equation that uses all of our givens in our problem. From here, just add our values, and we get 9.75 times 10 to the negative second kilograms times meters squared per second. Now keep in mind that we found a change in momentum when the problem asks us to find the final momentum. But since the table started at rest, the change in momentum and final momentum are equal to each other. So what if the mass of the system is 4 kilograms? What is the final angular velocity if friction is negligible? We know a few things here. We want to find angular velocity. Angular momentum is related to the angular velocity in terms of the object's moment of inertia. So if we could find the moment of inertia and the angular momentum, we could easily determine the angular velocity. Again, looking at figure 10-12 in the book, 
We find that the moment of inertia for a rotating disk is one half the mass times the radius squared. We know all of these values, so we can easily determine the moment of inertia. We determined the angular momentum a minute ago in the first part of this problem, which means that we can go ahead and solve for the angular velocity, which is 0.721 radians per second. So how does this all work out? Well, we know that the torque is the change in angular momentum over a certain amount of time. We can talk about this in terms of the change in angular momentum equal to the torque acting over some time. If we assume that linear momentum is conserved when the net external force on the system is zero, then for angular momentum, we can assume that the net external torque is zero. And just a little bit of algebra gives us the final angular momentum equal to the initial angular momentum. We know that the conservation of linear momentum tells us that the initial momentum of a system is equal to the final momentum of the system, as long as there is no net external force acting on the system. It stands to reason, then, that angular momentum will follow the same pattern. Since angular momentum is the moment of inertia times the angular velocity, we can also write this expression in those terms. This just shows that if we have a large rotational inertia, then our angular velocity will be small. But if we decrease our moment of inertia, then our angular velocity will increase. If you've ever watched a figure skater move into a spin, you've seen that this can be a dramatic change. Suppose an ice skater is spinning at 0.8 revolutions per second with her arms extended. She has a moment of inertia of 2.34 kilograms times meters squared with her arms extended, and 0.363 kilograms times meters squared with her arms close to her body. What is her angular velocity after she pulls in her arms? Now, because she's skating on ice, there's very little friction involved with the spin. This lets us assume that the net torque acting on her is zero, which in turn lets us use our law of conservation of angular momentum. Since we are looking for the final angular velocity, we can use the moment of inertia and angular velocity from our conservation of angular momentum equation, rearranged to solve for the final angular velocity. We know all of those terms there on the right, so we can just plug those in. What we find is that just by bringing her arms in close to her body, the skater can go from less than one revolution per second to just over five revolutions per second. So what is the skater's rotational kinetic energy before and after she pulls in her arms? We know that rotational kinetic energy is found using the moment of inertia and the angular velocity. Now remember that the angular velocity needs to be converted from revolutions per second to radians per second. To do this, we multiply the given revolutions per second by 2 pi. So for the initial angular kinetic energy, we use our initial moment of inertia and initial angular velocity. For the final angular kinetic energy, we use our final moment of inertia and final angular velocity. The initial rotational kinetic energy for our skater is 29.6 joules, while the final rotational kinetic energy is 191 joules. Again, simply by pulling in her arms, the skater greatly increases the amount of energy associated with her rotation. So again, angular momentum is analogous to linear momentum. In order to find angular momentum, we use the moment of inertia times the angular velocity. Any change in angular momentum is going to be because of a net torque acting on the system. If the net torque acting on a system is zero, then the final angular momentum is going to be equal to the initial angular momentum.